Hello, everybody. It's six o'clock and it's time for our author's talk. I'm Carol Willis. I'm the uh, director of the Skyscraper Museum and I'm sitting here at the gallery of our exhibition, which um, opens uh, officially on Thursday called Residential Rising Lower Manhattan since 9-11. Uh, and I tried to pick some stony buildings and, uh, to go in the background so that we would be thematically connected to the great masonry towers of the, of the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, and I'm gonna take these glasses off in a, a minute because it's really hard to see with them on unless you're looking at this absolutely wonderful book with, which is Building the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, which of course spanned from 1869 to 1883 when it opened, an illustrated history with images in 3D. And the author, Jeff Richmond, Jeffrey Richmond, is um, going to show us, uh, as he said, way too many images tonight. We'll have about an ex uh, extravaganza of about uh, 100 or, or so images of the construction of the bridge in particular, um, but also a, a kind of uh, narrative, so familiar to some, but I think astounding to others if you don't know the story of the these extraordinary people um, who were responsible, um, the Roeblings, um, for the Brooklyn Bridge's design and construction. This fits in our construction history um, series that we did, ooh, it's really hard to see, I'll take these off. <laughs> um, these, these glasses, by the way, come with the book, which you should definitely buy. It's a real bargain at $55, and it's even cheaper if you go um, to one of the gigantic purveyors of, of books on, online. Um, and the, these are tucked into the back, and the many, many uh, views, uh, the anaglyph views that turn flat images uh, into 3D via this vehicle of, of two colors will just really knock your socks off. They're absolutely spectacular. Um, originally, as they were created, executed um, in, uh, translated from stereoscopes um, into this format for print and, um, and then gathered um, so brilliantly by, by Jeff Richmond. So um, this series fits into what you see here on the screen now, the works in progress construction history series that we did um, looking in a series of uh, actually six, total of six lectures on uh, comparative New York and Chicago in the 19th century, the late 19th century, as the skeleton frame begins to supplant the masonry tower. So the, a, a story of stone and steel, which is very close um, to uh, one kind of origin story of stone and steel in, in New York, and, and that's the history of the Brooklyn Bridge. So um, Jeff uh, Richmond has just come onto the screen, and I'm going to give him a short introduction. Um, he is, uh, after 33 years of uh, being a practicing attorney, uh, he became the historian at the Greenwood Cemetery, where he has overseen um, many projects, both his own archival in terms of collecting, but also marshalling hundreds of volunteers uh, in order to um, tell the stories of the, uh, of the Civil War and a whole range of, of topics um, that connect Greenwood as a place to New York City's uh, history. But he, as you will describe, has been in, uh, passionately in love with the Brooklyn Bridge for many a year and is um, really an outstanding collector of memorabilia connect around the bridge, but also uh, bringing together paper sources, illustrations from many um, different directions to this in really incredible compendium of a visual history, which he accompanies with um, the, the, his, his narrative history and his explanations of the construction um, in the text part of the book. So um, I think it's the time to let Jeff take over um, to, I'll get off the screen and Jeff, you share your screen. I will um, invite you to put your questions into the chat um, and I will then uh, select, uh, while I'm off screen, select read and, and select some of the images, uh, some, some of the questions, and, and I hope that we can get to those um, in a discussion that we'll have at, at a Q&A 
uh, at the very end. So Jeff, I'm going to um, stop my screen share and leave you now and you take over. So here is Jeff Richmond. Well, thank you very much, Carol. And it is a uh, honor and a pleasure to be here this evening with the Skyscraper Museum. Uh, and so we will show you some of the images from the book and share the story of the Brooklyn Bridge, the iconic Brooklyn Bridge and how it was built. And so here is the title of the book. The book came out uh, last October. Uh, it's just won an award from the Victorian Society as one of the great books of 2021, which I'm very proud of. So here is the cover of the book and let's get oriented. So this will be easy for most of you. We see here, New Jersey, the Hudson River, Manhattan, the East River and Brooklyn. And what is key to understanding here is that by the 1860s, uh, most people in Manhattan concluded that there was just no place to go with new construction. Uh, the skyscraper was not yet on the horizon. And so you needed space and where could you find space? And so if we look at the upper right corner, you see all that green that is Brooklyn and Long Island. And if you built a reliable transportation mode to get across the East River Bridge, you could access that space. So Brooklyn four times the acreage of Manhattan was very, very tempting. And so extraordinarily by just a few years after the bridge opened in 1883, it was already being held as the eighth wonder of the world. This is a token that was issued in 1889 for the hundredth anniversary of George Washington's inauguration. And what shows up, but this new bridge that was only six years old at the time uh, described as the progress of 100 years, the eighth wonder. So it was quickly adopted by New Yorkers, both Brooklynites and Manhattanites. And it also became a very hot topic for all sorts of advertising. So you see these spools that are making up the cables here as all sorts of companies wanted to associate themselves with the success of the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, the masterwork, really uh, 50 years old now, The Great Bridge by David McCullough. You can see my copy is pretty worn. I've listened to it many, many times and read it uh, several times. And so a wonderful book, but uh, McCullough, you know, as the historian that he is, uh, is much more into text than imagery. And I thought that I had a unique opportunity with my collection, with collectors that I knew, with public archives, the Museum of the City of New York, the Municipal Archives, which has the original drawings of the bridge, uh, as well as Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute up in Troy, New York, uh, from which Washington Roebling, the chief engineer who built the bridge, uh, graduated and donated his collection. So uh, I was able to bring together 250 plus images to uh, tell this story. So here is John A. Roebling, who was the father of Washington Roebling and really uh, had a reputation as the number one suspension bridge builder in the world. And his son, Washington Roebling, who took over, uh, and we'll get to that shortly. And then Emily Roebling, who was the wife of Washington Roebling and became a key factor in the construction of the bridge. So again, the cover of the book, and here is the table of contents. And so what we see here is uh, an essay, a preface by building the Brooklyn Bridge one image at a time by Richard Haw. Richard Haw is the biographer of John Roebling. And then the Brooklyn Bridge, a love story, Erica Wagner is the biography of Washington Roebling. And so I was very happy that they were both willing to contribute to this book. And then we basically did the engineers, the workers, uh, the men who built the bridge, and then the various stages of the bridge up until opening day. So here are, we go through the chapters, the engineers. So we see Washington Roebling 
at bottom and John Roebling at top here. Chief engineers. John A. Roebling, a chief engineer trained in Germany as an engineer, studied philosophy by uh, one account. He was Hegel's favorite student. Uh, as you can see, he was known for those fierce eyes. Uh, he was not somebody who uh, it was known for his sense of humor or for his taking days off to go on vacation. He was very focused on the task at hand. And so he decided that Germany was not for him. He and generations of his family before him had grown up in Mulhausen, Germany. Uh, and he decided there was just too much bureaucracy in Germany. You could not get anything done. So he organized a small group of about 20 people to leave Germany and sort of uh, secretly because of his training, the German authorities would not have taken kindly to his leaving, but he fled Germany and went to Pennsylvania where he and his brother bought land near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And he declared himself a farmer, which was a bit strange because he had never farmed a day in his life. And quickly he decided that farming was not for him. So after about a year of kind of poking around doing that, he decided his wife would be the farmer and he would be something else. He had read in a European journal about wire rope manufacturing and that's where he started to go. And then suspension bridge builder. So here is Saxonburg. Pennsylvania, just a few hundred people live there today. This is the village founded by the Roebling brothers and they have this wonderful model, which kind of uh, tickles my fancy of the bridge adjoining the local historical society. Uh, they became the leading wire rope manufacturers in the world, John Roebling and Sons and uh, established themselves primarily in Trenton, New Jersey, which became the base for this work. Washington Roebling was an RPI graduate in engineering. If you wanted to become an engineer in America in this period, the mid 19th century, you either went to West Point to become a military engineer or RPI to become a civil engineer. Uh, by the time the Brooklyn Bridge construction started, he was already an experienced bridge builder. Uh, he would take summers off to help his father build bridges. He was a Civil War veteran, uh, had enlisted as a private, and had risen to the rank of lieutenant colonel. Uh, tremendous leadership qualities. Uh, he was also the chief engineer in waiting. If John Roebling could not do the Brooklyn Bridge work, then it would have been Washington Roebling. And but his father planned the bridge and then got himself killed, ironically, by the Fulton Ferry. And so we'll discuss that momentarily. So he is 32 years old when he takes over this construction, this multi million dollar construction, uh, this pioneering work of the Brooklyn Bridge. Emily Roebling uh, had gone to Europe with Washington to study caissons. Uh, which we will talk about more. And when Washington Roebling became debilitated from overwork, just working, 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 and basically had a collapse and also suffered suffer physically from the bends, she became the liaison to Washington Roebling. And so he was holed up in on Brooklyn Heights where he could see most of the bridge with a telescope. And she would uh, discuss the day's work with Washington and then go out and explain to the assistant engineers and the workers what was involved. She was tremendously admired by the staff. She uh, led the first delegation to walk across the bridge as the construction was proceeding. And then at her husband's insistence, she was the first to ride across the bridge in a carriage uh, holding a rooster as a symbol of triumph. So crossing the East River had been going on for quite a while. Here's the Fulton Ferry in a print from 1750. And we have Brooklyn in the foreground and Manhattan in the distance across the East River. 
and they're running ferries across. Uh, this was basically the spot where George Washington's army would escape at the end of the Battle of Brooklyn. And so there was a demand to get across the East River. Whoops. But uh, as early as uh, horse powered boats. And so they actually had horses on treadmills before Fulton came along with the steam engine powering ferries and they were running ferries across. But the problem was uh, that in those days before climate change, the East River would freeze and then it would thaw. And so people who had to get to work living in Brooklyn, Brooklyn Heights, the first suburb of Manhattan would start to walk across the ice and then the ice would start to break up and you had to have rescues to get people uh, saved. So that was not a very reliable way uh, to get across. And the solution was a suspension bridge. And so you see here, Scientific American, 1879, the great suspension bridges of the United States and it pictures four suspension bridges. And the first one is a rolling bridge and the second one and the third one and the fourth one. And this gives you some idea of the reputation of rolling bridges. There were other people building bridges in Europe, in the United States. Uh, typically their bridges uh, at one point or another would collapse. Uh, John Roebling, Washington Roebling never had a bridge collapse. So they did fine, fine work. Here's the Niagara Bridge that they built across the gorge, 1851 to 1855, when Washington Roebling was still a student. Uh, here's a stereo view. So these are side-by-side -side images, uh, slightly different. And when you put them into a lens viewer, it gives you a 3D effect. Uh, we merged them using a program from a Japanese uh, software genius who figured out how to do this. And so with those glasses that we have, you can see these uh, in 3D and they are full page in the book. So there are 44 3D images in the book. This shows you the Niagara Bridge and it was actually a two-tiered bridge, which was very, very unusual. The top tier, uh, up in here, you could run a railroad uh, train across. And so it'd go very slowly, five miles an hour, but the bridge would support the weight. And the bottom tier was for carriages and pedestrians. Um, Mark Twain apparently went across the bridge. He was not a fan. He said between the idea of the train above you collapsing on top of you or the entire bridge collapsing below you, uh, he, he did not enjoy the experience. So here we are a little bit later, 1857 to 59 in Pittsburgh, the Allegheny Bridge. And so as they're doing this, they are refining their technique. They are improving what they're doing. They are uh, making things uh, better able to uh, bear uh, more and more weight. And then we have the Cincinnati Covington Bridge, 1856 to 1866, construction halted by the Civil War. Uh, this goes from Covington, Kentucky, across the Ohio River to Cincinnati, which we see on the far bank here. And for those of you, uh, most of you who are familiar with the Brooklyn Bridge, this really feels like the Brooklyn Bridge and uh, has the distinctive mark of a Roebling Bridge. It is now known as the Roebling Bridge in honor of John Roebling. So here are a Curry and Ives print of a the Great East River Suspension Bridge. Brooklyn Bridge was known by a number of names, the Great Bridge, the East River Bridge, et cetera, et cetera. But this shows you the basic idea, oops, <clears throat> involved here. And so you had, you had towers, which allowed the deck of the bridge to get high enough that ships could continue to go underneath it, which was particularly important here because you had uh, the Brooklyn Navy Yard to the north and all of their ships had to get underneath. And then you have the cables, four cables for the Brooklyn Bridge, and those were made out of steel. And so this was a pioneering use of steel construction. And those, uh, you hung suspenders straight down. And the suspenders, then you attach the deck to, to support that. 
So here's John Roebling's plans for an East River Bridge, 1857, essentially where the 59th Street Bridge is now, is where he was thinking. Uh, this was never built, but he did have the East River on his uh, radar, so to speak, before there was radar. And so here we see the Fulton Ferry landing in Brooklyn with the Brooklyn Tower of the bridge at far left and the mansard roof of the Fulton Ferry. And there were actually five ferry lines that ran across carrying thousands of people every day. This gives you an idea a little bit closer. This is the Hamilton Ferry. And you see these pilings here at lower right. And those are important to understand because uh, in June of 1869, Washington and John and one of the assistant engineers were down at the Fulton Ferry taking measurements to figure out exactly where the center line of the bridge was to go. And John jumped up on the pilings as he saw the Fulton Ferry coming in, thought he was safe and in fact he was not. And he got his foot crushed. Uh, he was taken to a doctor where he supervised the amputation of his own toes uh, with no anesthetic and then decided that he was going to treat with a water treatment which did not go well either and he was dead within a matter of weeks a very painful death by lockjaw and so his son Washington who had not planned the bridge but would build the bridge uh, stepped in as the chief engineer so here's John Roebling the ferry killed him in Trenton, New Jersey, where he is interred. And here is Washington Roebling. As I said, he was able to monitor the construction of the bridge. Uh, one of the most extraordinary facts of the bridge is that in the 14 years of its construction, uh, Washington Roebling never set foot on the bridge. And so when he was ill, when he could not see, uh, when he had to do calculations in his head, when he couldn't meet with people because any kind of conversation drove him uh, crazy. Uh, he would watch what was going on with that telescope here. It's shown as binoculars, a little artistic license, and then would uh, instruct Emily on what had to be done. So I was kind of thrilled as I began to work on this book that there were just such extraordinary images an image from 1872 of the staff. And what's great here is that it has a key with the individuals identified. And here is 1878. Trustees had left in their suits and their high hats and draftsmen and assistant engineers at right and center. And so here we see close up of that same image. And what we see here is the fellow at the left in the foreground is William Payne, who was one of the six assistant engineers. Uh, he had served in the Civil War with Washington Roebling. They were comrades from the Civil War. They were both engineers. They would change out of their uniforms and go out into the Virginia countryside to make maps and act as spies risking uh, a tremendous act of courage because they were risking immediate execution had they been captured. And then this fellow with his left arm leaning over at uh, kind of right center is George McNulty. McNulty had just graduated from the University of Virginia at the age of 21 in 1869 and applied to be an assistant engineer. And he was rejected ostensibly because he did not have experience. And he said he would volunteer, he would work uh, without getting paid. And Washington Roebling was so impressed by that, that he hired uh, McNulty. They became fast friends to the extent that one of uh, McNulty's sons was named Washington McNulty. Uh, there were six assistant engineers. One was hired on a 30 day contract early on. Each of the six worked the entire 14 years. So it gives you some idea of how they responded to Washington Roebling's leadership and how faithful they were to this construction. So here as uh, in my capacity as Greenwood Cemetery historian, uh, this is Colonel Payne's gravestone there. 
And here is George McNulty's. This is a gravestone that I had put out from McNulty, who was formerly in an unmarked grave. So again, wonderful, wonderful photographs, uh, great detail, wonderfully formed and constructed. Here are workers on the bridge all kind of lined up here, uh, a detail of the workers and just several photographs that I was able to find or crop showing the workers who worked on the bridge. Uh, there were several thousand men who worked on the bridge uh, and uh, there was a fair amount of turnover, particularly when they were working the caissons, which was this compressed air, muddy, wet, hot, humid environment. And so they were losing about a third of their men every week. But Washington Roebling noted that they had no problem recruiting new men. Uh, many immigrants, German, Irish, Italian, uh, many Civil War veterans and many uh, sailors who were comfortable being up high above the river. So here is a uh, wonderfully uh, laid out 3D images. image. This is a half stereo, so we can't see it in 3D, but a photographer who clearly knew what he was doing with the barrels in the foreground and then mid ground and then the tower in the distance. And here is the anaglyph of that. And so if you do have glasses uh, around, you're welcome to grab those and enjoy some of these anaglyphs as we go through them. Here are men working on the approaches. And so the approaches had to be very, very long because you had to be able to get both people and horses up on the bridge, even when the bridge was wet. And so you needed this very gradual incline. Uh, the bridge itself is over a mile long because of that. And so here are the caissons. Uh, as I said, uh, Washington and Emily went to Europe to study caissons. Uh, this uh, was a wooden box that was open on the bottom that was built uh, by shipyards on the East River from timber and with iron uh, bolts. And you get some idea of the scale. It was 168 feet long by 102 feet wide. When it was fully done, it was launched into the East River and then towed to where it was going to be, put in position. And then this would be the uh, foundation for the towers. And so this box and the other box for the other tower are still in position below the towers of the Brooklyn Bridge. And they're deep enough down that the worms, uh, sea worms, don't get them. So before you were going to dig these boxes into the ground, they would become the largest anything ever dug into the ground in human history uh, when they were dug down. You wanted to get, take borings to see what uh, you were going to encounter. And so this is an example. The Municipal Archives has these wonderful original drawings. And here is some of the detail of what they were going to hit you know, down 32 feet and 34 feet and 38 feet, et cetera. So here we are uh, launching the caissons, uh, photographs, uh, woodcuts, uh, 3D images all brought together to tell this story. And here is Eckford Webb, who is buried at Greenwood. If you know Greenwood's catacombs, you see the vents to the catacombs at the left side of his monument. Uh, this is granite, which is unusual, it's very hard stone, uh, showing that he was in fact a shipmaker. He built some of the largest ships on the sea, and yet his proudest accomplishment was his work on the Brooklyn Bridge. An eminent shipbuilder and constructor of the caissons for the first Brooklyn suspension bridge. So this shows you the caisson in operation at the bottom the men working in six partition chambers. And then there were various uh, facilities that helped make it possible to do what the caisson had to do. So the space that they were working in was compressed air to keep the East River from flooding into the workspace and drowning the workers, which not, would not have gone well. And then you had these scoops, these clamshell buckets that went down through water the water was there to keep the compressed air in the space. 
and it was a balancing act how much water to put in there. But these scoops would come down and scoop up the debris that the men had shaken loose and the boulders that they had broken apart. And then you see locks here, air locks, which kept the air, oops, kept the air inside the chamber. And then you also have supply shafts that allowed them to get concrete and bricks into the space when they had the caisson at the depth that they wanted, uh, which would uh, ostensibly be on bedrock. So here are some early drawings of the bridge with a much less sophisticated uh, array. And here we see uh, much more and you can see the tower of the bridge being built directly atop the timbers of the uh, caisson, the foundation. There's a photograph from 1872 showing, you can see some snow in the midground there. Uh, and you also see those chimneys at the left side. And so those are the engines, the steam engines that are compressing the air into and then being pumped into the caisson. So here's the caisson here. And here is the Brooklyn Tower, which was slightly more uh, progressed than the Manhattan Tower. And we see some writing over on the left-hand side. And if we look more closely, it says air compressor house and it says winter. And uh, Erica Wagner, who is an expert on all things Washington Roebling assures me that that is uh, Washington Roebling's handwriting. And so here's an airlock. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, there are no photographs inside the caisson. And so we rely upon woodcuts that were printed in illustrated newspapers as people followed along all around the world, the construction of this extraordinary uh, bridge, breaking up boulders, moving debris, and the water shaft and pool, they discovered that this uh, pool at the bottom of the water shaft that the uh, clamshell bucket was dipping into uh, tended to harden. And so they had to get the men to mix it uh, to keep it liquid and you see water being pumped at the bottom left there to keep it as liquid as possible. Here is Washington Rollings, the vertical dredgers, two years before the bridge was uh, started, but he's planning. And so some wonderfully graphic designs for the bridge construction. And here, this really, uh, this photograph shows you the mix of cutting edge technology and the most primitive of technologies. And so where you are atop the Brooklyn caisson here, you see the clamshell bucket here and here, two clamshell buckets. They are gonna be dipping down there. And you see this fellow seated up here on a board and what in the world is he doing? And so I did have a uh, engineer familiar with historic bridge construction who explained to me that that fellow had one job and one job only. And that was to wave to the operator of the steam engine who was controlling the height of these clamshell buckets when it reached the bottom to tell him not to drop it anymore. So steel teeth on this, which was kind of unprecedented and at the same time, just a wave uh, the most primitive of technologies there. So here we see one of the clamshell buckets more closely. Uh, I was very happy that I was able to interweave various photographs that told part of the story here and part of the story there. Here are the towers of the bridge. Again, we can tell Brooklyn in the distance because it's uh, higher up than the Manhattan Tower. And here is an original drawing by Washington, uh, by John Roebling, excuse me, of the tower. And so this was very much influenced by his experience of growing up in a walled city in Germany and the idea of granite. And so I think that these towers are really a key to the iconic status of the Brooklyn Bridge. When you look at this as compared to the Manhattan Bridge or the Williamsburg Bridge or the George Washington Bridge, this to me has a greater sense of solidity 
and a greater sense of ceremony that you are leaving one space and entering another grand space. Here's a detail of the drawing. You can see this woman with a parasol kind of put in there, perhaps for scale, perhaps uh, just because uh, they could. So here is uh, Washington Roebling drawing the uh, one of the towers from above. And what's important to understand here is that the towers were hollow. And so you see these spaces here and here and here and here. He calculated it as an engineer that they did not have to be solid. You could save time and money on construction costs and labor. And so that's what they did. So the towers that went up are in fact hollow. Here we are, just a wonderful photograph again of the suits in the foreground, the workers up here. You see the Brooklyn Tower peeking over the Manhattan Tower as it rises. And you see a photographer, I think, who had a tremendous uh, cachet with the bridge people because he got the workers to hang these granite stones up here to make the photograph even more spectacular. So here we are, Skyscraper Museum. Here's the skyscraper of the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, it is just, it's hard to tell with this photograph, but it's just slightly shorter than the Tribune uh, Spire, which is here, uh, Tribune Building but you see how it dwarfs these buildings in the South Street sea, uh, Seaport area. This building is still there, uh, but just uh, much, much higher than what people were used to in New York. So here are just three anaglyphs beauty shots of the bridge, nicely uh, constructed photographs by these photographers. And here we are, Brooklyn from the Brooklyn Tower. Uh, Brooklyn is known as the city of churches. And so particularly up at the horizon, you can see all of those church spires. And then the anchorage. So you had to build something that would grab or hold the ends of the cables. And this is what they did, these anchorages, uh, since there was no natural feature to which you could attach the cables. And they created these chains inside this massive uh, stone construction. These again are hollow. Uh, in 1983, I was able to go into the Brooklyn Anchorage and they actually had art exhibitions in that space. And John Roebling touted the space inside the anchorages as more secure than Fort Knox, that that's where the United States government could uh, keep its gold if it so chose. This gives you a perspective. You see the two towers, the Manhattan Tower in the uh, midground, and then the Brooklyn Tower in the distance, and the anchorage. So this shows you the perspective. You're going to get cables running out of the anchorage, up to the tower, across the tower, then dipping between the two towers, and then down to the anchorage on the other side. Anchor plates, so this is what you attached the uh, wires to, the 19 strands, the anaglyph, the anchor bars as you built up the anchor chain. And here they are as the 3D anaglyph. And then the footbridge and cradles. So as they, they actually spun the wires of the cables in place. And so they started from the Brooklyn side and essentially pulled a wire across, one wire at a time. But they needed to be able to have the workers out on these cradles that you see here. And you reach the cradles through this footbridge, which was just temporary. Uh, it no longer is there. It was taken down as the construction uh, was completed. And it was the job of these workers to monitor the wires to make sure they were all in the same tension. So here you see the cradles between the towers. And here you see a wonderful 3D image from the top of the tower looking down at the footbridge with Manhattan in the distance. 
And here is a uh, non-OSHA approved uh, worker situation here where he's just wedged a board about 200 feet up in the air. And he's got a flag in his right hand and he's monitoring the cables uh, as they're being spun with his left hand. And he's gonna wave this flag if the uh, most recent wire is too tight or too loose. Uh, one of my favorite photographs uh, showing the footbridge and the access to the footbridge. So this sign reads safe for only 25 men at one time. Do not walk close together, nor run, jump, or trot. Break step, WA Roebling Engineer in Chief. And so what you don't see here is a gate at the entrance to the footbridge or a security guard or anything to prevent people from coming up here. So people would climb up on top of the anchorage and go across on the footbridge from anchorage to anchorage. And so uh, here are a couple of anaglyphs, another anaglyph. You can see the spacing of the oak uh, slats to allow the wind to go through without causing undue shaking of the footbridge. And regrets, I've had a few uh, people were allowed to go up on the footbridge and a number of people went up there and then quickly regretted their uh, choice of doing so. Uh, one of the uh, senior uh, mechanics on the bridge said that for whatever reason, women seemed to do a better job up on the footbridge than the men did, but they did have to rescue a number of people who just couldn't move anymore. So here we are, the cables, which were really key to the bridge. Uh, Master mechanic E.F. Farrington riding the traveler. So this was the first wire that was strung across and Farrington wanted to demonstrate to his workers how safe it would be to be hanging from this wire and the other wires that they were gonna be used using. Uh, Farrington hoped to do this quietly just for his workers. Uh, the Brooklyn Eagle got wind of it and 20,000 people showed up and they wanted to carry Farrington in triumph through the streets and he wasn't having it. So this gives you an idea of the basic mechanism that they were using. Uh, they would attach a wire and then pull it across and then bring what they called the uh, carrier back. Here's the carrier wheel. The uh, former Brooklyn Historical Society actually has one of these in its collection. And the wire splicer. So each of the wires was 800 feet long. The bridge used 13,000 miles of wire. So you're going California and back and California and back uh, roughly. And so, uh, and then a little bit more. So they had to do a lot of splicing. And this, I thought, is just a wonderfully graphic design of this machine that they invented to rapidly and efficiently create a splice that would not break. So here you see atop the Brooklyn Anchorage is the wire shed. This, there was only one wire shed, which was very helpful in terms of identifying whether we were in Brooklyn or Manhattan. Uh, here we're looking down towards the wire shed from essentially the Brooklyn Tower. And here you see there were uh, there would be four cables, so two spools of wire that they would replace as they needed for each of the cables. And here's where the anchor bars, which you see here, and the strands of the cables attached, and then the anchor bars went down into the anchorage. Uh, the practice in Europe had been to keep these anchor bars exposed inside the anchorage. Washington Roebling chose not to do that. He said Americans are an impatient people, and he did not feel secure in the belief that they would take care of his anchor bars. So he just wrapped them with stone and called it a day so that no one would have to go back in there and take care of them. Uh, here's a wonderful Washington Roebling drawing as he mused about 
where the 19 separate strands of each cable would be uh, arrayed. And here you see he's actually crossing numbers out. So uh, strand number 14 is going to become 16, and 15 is going to become 14, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is uh, in my collection. It's a few feet from me as I speak. Uh, just a wonderful lantern slide. Uh, I was able to buy a number of years ago on eBay from a Tennessee uh, re TV repair store, a uh, collection of photographs of the bridge being built, many of which don't exist anywhere else except in this box that I have. And th this is actually in Manhattan. So again, we're seeing the Tribune building. We're seeing the old uh, post office here. Uh, City Hall would be down in here. And you see four cables. So two cables have already been bracketed and two, the cable, the strands are still visible in this one and the one at far right. So you see the progress here and you also see the uh, footbridge. This is on top of one of the towers. Uh, as they came across these saddles. Uh, Washington and Roebling spent a lot of time calculating the weight on these things and how strong they had to be. And ultimately the wheels that were supposed to rotate, it, uh, rotate on here collapsed and did not work. So they wrapped the cables in the winter, working through the year. Uh, using zinc, galvanized zinc wire, and it worked tremendously well to keep the salt air off the steel cables. So now we're on the deck as it's being built. Uh, there were essentially three sections, which became uh, several more sections as they did this. Uh, just a wonderful drawing of the approach, which is what supported the deck when it was not hanging from the suspenders of, that were attached to the cables. So here we see the approach. Uh, construction railway, they moved granite around with the, uh, a temporary railway that was wood and these cars that could bear weight. And so here you see a load that they're moving from one part of the construction site to the other. And then the suspended superstructure. So you see these guys kind of casually hanging out here. This is Manhattan. And you see these straight wires coming down. Those are the suspenders coming off the cables. And these are the steel deck uh, beams that they're gonna hang from the suspenders. And so here is the attachment shown. And here is the five sections of the bridge. So you had carriages, you had herds of cattle and pigs and sheep that would go on the outside here. And then they would build a railway that opened in September of 1883, uh, a uh, railway designed by William Payne, a cable car. So they didn't have to use railroad uh, steam engines. And then the elevated promenade, which was absolutely spectacular. And I think uh, is my favorite part of the bridge today. So here we see the bridge in operation uh, and then the railroad cars and the terminals uh, that they built to get people across. As I mentioned, Payne was a pioneer of cable car. He worked out in uh, San Francisco, in Denver and Cleveland on their cable cars. And so it was, uh, he developed a mechanism that would grab the cable as it moved, uh, but would not jolt the passengers. Uh, a steam engine, a very powerful steam engine for that time was uh, built underneath the Brooklyn Tower, uh, excuse me, the uh, Brooklyn Terminal to drive the cable cars. And here we see the terminals being built. Here's a, a drawing from the municipal archives. And you can see up at up right, up right the piece that was made from that drawing. So they had K, uh, cars going in each direction. It was five cents for a five minute ride 
to get you from Brooklyn to Manhattan or vice versa. Uh, so here is a movie from 1899 showing the bridge in operation. And this gives you an idea of how the bridge is has evolved over time. And so first of all, you see the cable uh, right between the tracks there. And you also see these trolleys that were installed subsequent to the bridge opening to allow for more mass transit on the bridge. And then you see the latest development in the evolution of the bridge, a uh, bicycle lane that opened September of last year and is to my mind, just a wonderful feature because anyone who wants to bicycle across is welcome to do so. And the bicycles and the pedestrians have now been uh, separated. So uh, it's a much uh, calmer and uh, less frightening walk across the bridge as it was meant to be. So opening day, here we go, September 20, uh, excuse me, May 24th of 1883. Uh, Washington Roebling wanted to just uh, open the bridge, put up a sign, we're open for business. Uh, he was outvoted by the trustees. And so they had this grand opening. He insisted that no pedestrians be on the bridge for the fireworks. And they also hosed down the bridge to make sure it wouldn't catch fire. So here we are, President Chester A. Arthur walking across the bridge, being met by Mayor Seth Lowe of Brooklyn. Uh, the flagman at the left is signaling to the North Atlantic fleet to salute uh, the opening of the bridge. And so here we are, a union of hearts, a union of hands. The two cities joined, the grand display of fireworks. And of course, the bridge has become iconic to the extent that when you want to advertise the Knicks versus the Nets, uh, you still would use the uh, Brooklyn Bridge as a background. So here is the bridge in all its glory today. And here is the book once again. And so let me just take a moment to read uh, the review I'm most proud of from Kurt Anderson, author of Evil Geniuses, Fantasy Land, Heyday. Uh, if you love Brooklyn or bridges or New York City or cities or 19th century marvels or all of the above as I do, building the Brooklyn Bridge is a perfect feast. a would be time traveler's delight overflowing with rare and evocative and fascinating images. It's a terrific book. And so just conclude with Montgomery Schuyler, who is also interred at Greenwood Cemetery. Uh, he was a critic for the Harper's uh, Weekly. And he wrote, it so happens that the work which is likely to be our most durable monument and to convey some knowledge of us to the most remote posterity is a work of bare utility, not a shrine, not a fortress, not a palace, but a bridge. And so thank you very much. And uh, if you do have any questions, I'll be happy to stop sharing my screen and answer those. Great, thank you, Jeff. That was absolutely fantastic. And I was wearing my glasses to see uh, the anaglyphs. And I really recommend to everybody that you get this book so that you can enjoy these and explore you know, in your mind's eye and in your eye on the page. Uh, it's they, they're just extraordinary. I guess 20th century technology meets the limits of mid 19th century photography. But what what that can accomplish is is a, a kind of time travel that one doesn't usually experience in in the in the flatter images. So um, this is, is such a service for um, for this this book to have been put together so beautifully by you and also to uh, praise your publisher. So I'm, I'm asking as an, an author myself and somebody who's interested in how you managed to uh, do, is, was it necessary to disinvent the book in order to get such high quality illustration? How, how, did, how did that work? Uh, first of all, my publisher would be thrilled <laughs> to hear you say that and uh, Actually, I came across, uh, so it's Bauer and Dean and Beth Doherty, and she did a wonderful, wonderful job. And our graphic designer just did extraordinary work cleaning things up and laying out. 
And, you know, some people are kind of down at Zoom after all these Zoom sessions. But to be able to edit a book on Zoom and to change the graphics design around and say, OK, can we see that as full page as opposed to, you know, and move this around? It was just uh, wonderful to be able uh, to do that. And so Beth did a great job. And um, very, this is my kind of fifth book. And uh, I'm very proud of this one. Yeah, well, you're, you're all to be congratulated for this project. Um, do folks put chat in? Um, hopefully that this is chat is working. Uh, we don't, don't see any questions right now, but I will continue to ask some of my own. Um, and just, uh, again, my curiosity about where you found rare images. Uh, you mentioned eBay, were there, you know, what, what other sources? Um, offer you know tr uh surprising treasures right so uh you know when you're a collector you're kind of a different breed and so i actually had bid on a uh, collection of 25 stereo views of the bridge being built and i was outbid and then i went to a memorial service for a collector friend and his widow at this memorial service took me over and said this is the fellow who outbid you <laughs> on that collection and so uh, michael ash i spoke with and i went to visit him and asked him if it would be possible to use those images in the book and he generously allowed me to do so and then i knew another great collector who probably has the best collection of new york views in existence and he agreed to allow me to use whatever I wanted in his collection. So that really had me off and running. And then to go to the public archives and supplement that material was uh, kind of a dream come true. Well, there are some questions. So let me let me quickly, because we only have really a few minutes left, um, ask uh, some of the, of the audience's questions. Do trains still cross the bridge? Uh, and why was the Brooklyn Tower constructed faster than the Manhattan one? Okay, so uh, no trains do not cross the bridge anymore. They eliminated the trains. So part of that evolution uh, in the 1950s when the automobile was king, they put three lanes in each direction for automobiles. And so, uh, there was no longer room for the uh, railroad cars to go across. Uh, and the second question was? Um, the Brooklyn Tower, why did it go up there? Oh, the, it was just a matter of they had to you know, start somewhere. And so they made a case, one case on and decided to start on the Brooklyn side. And so that kind of got a uh, advance uh, on the Manhattan side. So. It, it's convenient for uh, someone like me writing captions, trying to figure out which is which when you know that the higher tower is gonna to be on the uh, Brooklyn side. <laughs> right. Uh, someone wants to know uh, when the wire was installed, did they do it in a symmetrical manner or how was the work balanced? They did do it, so they were very, conscientious about working symmetrically. Uh, I didn't point out, but you can see in the images of the deck being installed that they came equally from each tower towards the middle. So as not to unduly stress the uh, towers and the construction. Uh, people are interested where Emily is, uh, Roebling is buried. Is, is she in Greenwood? No, no. There are three of the assistant engineers are in Greenwood. I've done several Brooklyn Bridge uh, tours there. We do have uh, a number of the trustees, virtually all of the Brooklyn trustees are in Greenwood. Uh, she uh, was actually the sister of Governor Warren, who was a controversial Civil War general. And the Warren family was from Cold Spring, New York, along the Hudson. And so both she and Washington are interred uh, there side by side. 
And one thing I did want to mention, I, I talked about how debilitated he was and how he suffered tremendous pains uh, from the bends over the years. He actually outlived everyone who had worked on the bridge. So he was this little old man who lived uh, until the late 1920s. Uh, and uh, people thought, uh, you know, were amazed that he was still alive that long. Mm -hmm. um, there are lots of now individual questions. So I'm going to tell everybody to buy the book because there is a very rich text uh, in which most of these questions are answered. Here's, here's one from me. Um, when, when was the bridge paid off? When did it become profitable? It became profitable very, very quickly. And so that was part of the lure. It was actually chartered by New York State as a stock company. And so you could buy stock in the bridge. And Boss Tweed, who is also a permanent Greenwood resident, uh, was paid off to a uh, significant extent to cooperate with the construction of the bridge. It ultimately was originally uh, budgeted at $5 million, which was a pretty good chunk for him to bite into and uh, ultimately cost $15 million. Mm -hmm. So the it was so popular initially, I believe the numbers are somewhere in the range of 20 million people crossing the bridge in the first year of its operation which they're charging five cents and they were actually charging a penny to walk across the bridge until that was changed shortly after the bridge opened. But they were bringing in significant income and I would I don't know the exact date, but I think it was paid off pretty quickly. Well, we're a little after seven o'clock already, but um, I, I think this question of the profitability of the bridge stock investors and how things are paid off is, is, the, is the connection to the skyscraper and the future of the skyscraper city. The Brooklyn Bridge was a great work of architectural genius, of engineering genius, of, uh, of ambition and innovation. It was a commercial project, like, like all skyscrapers. And so it is you know an utterly New York building in that sense, um, one that connects two cities that were that were both growing uh, and the demand for which was um, a, a connector between cities rather than a, a, a bridge over a long railroad connection between far far flung places. So um, it is certainly um, an incredible uh, example of New York ingenuity, whether it's Manhattan or, or a Brooklyn side of it, um, but also just the entrepreneurial drive as well as, as the um, genius that, that's brought um, to making money in this city. So you've, you've given us one of the granddaddies of the skyscraper in a lot of ways um, uh, in its masonry and its lack of bedrock that it went down to uh, ultimately uh, and um, for a, a masonry tradition that turns into a steel tradition in the 20th century. So um, it really, uh, the, the Brooklyn Bridge really is a, a forefather um, of the skyscraper. So thank you for being with the skyscraper Museum and be this prologue um, to our high rise history. And thank you. It's really been a pleasure. Thanks so much. Um, everybody, join us next time, uh, early August, I think it's the second, when Christiane Bird will talk about a block in New York um, called A Block in Time, her book that is. Uh, um, a kind of layered history of the block between Fifth Avenue and Sixth Avenue and 23rd and 24th Street, one of the most intensely developed um, and, and also uh, changing and transforming blocks um, in the history of New York, as she demonstrates. So come back then. Um, and so all we'll see you next time. And again, thanks so much, Jeff. Um, bye, everybody. Enjoy right. your beautiful summer. Thank you.